Good morning, everyone. My name is Tino Cuellar. I have the privilege of being the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So across town, the World Bank and the IMF are having their spring meetings, and the growth forecast has just been lowered to something closer to 2.8%. It's perfectly logical to understand why there's Ukraine conflict, headwinds from inflation, supply chain issues. But if you think for a moment what just a few basis points in global growth means for billions of people who are still struggling in all kinds of ways around the world, it puts the focus on the reality that the global economic system, the technology development is ultimately really about real people and the lives that they have and their families and their struggles to raise their kids. As we start here at Carnegie today, an even deeper engagement with the issue of digital public infrastructure and its implications for artificial intelligence, for delivering services to people in countries that are struggling with poverty. I want all of us to keep in mind that yes, there are plenty of technical issues, there are risks, there are possibilities to misunderstand what this can do, there are ways to misuse it, but there's also a continuing imperative as we think about where the world is and where it needs to be to close those gaps in people's well-being and to think about how a particular approach to digital infrastructure might help. To engage in that conversation, to explore the details, to give us a sense of what might be some interesting ways forward on what is perhaps one of the more interesting pieces of the global conversation on technology, I am delighted to have with us today Nanda Nilakani, known to many of you as the founder, chairman of Infosys, but also somebody who's been a driving force in India around the development of a set of approaches to bring banking and to bring digital identity to first millions and then hundreds of millions of people and now to 1.3 billion people. The work that he has done is not only interesting because it bridges the public and private sectors, but because it also spans not only India with all its diversity, but the many, many countries around the world that are facing some of the trade-offs and challenges that India has faced over the years. Today, over 50 countries are already thinking about what digital public infrastructure means for them. And the question of what that will let us do over the next 20 years, how we get there, how to set guardrails and deal with the concerns that people might have about this approach in the US and abroad is gonna be the focus of the conversation today. Now, I'm delighted that that conversation will engage one of my favorite people at Carnegie, my colleague Dan Baer, our Senior Vice President for Policy Research, former U.S. Ambassador to the OSCE, and somebody whom I know you will find an engaging interlocutor for Nandan. So please welcome both of them to the stage. Thank you. For kicking us off, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here today, and thank you to the many hundreds of people uh, I know who are joining us online. We're glad to have you with us as well, and we hope that both people in the room and people online will ask questions. I'm going to start the conversation, and we're going to have the first part of the conversation between the two of us, but the sooner you put in questions, the sooner I can uh, uh, transfer to uh, including the room and, and the broader room online in the conversation, and they will come to me on this iPad, so I will have them at, at the ready. But I wanted to start, you know, um, DPIs are something that in certain parts of the world, when you talk about DPIs, you could go into kind of any uh, well-educated space or policy space and people would know exactly what you're talking about. And in the largest economy in the world, uh, the, mo the largest advanced economy in the world, if you say DPIs in, the, in any bar in Washington, probably people don't know what you're talking about. And so, I wanted to start with kind of three challenges for DPIs. The first is a vision challenge, then a, then a technical challenge, and a political challenge. And there's actually a fourth one that kind of isn't, which is the financial challenge, which is unusual about uh, something like this, where there isn't, it doesn't play as much of a role. But the vision challenge strikes me as um, where we might begin, which is how would you describe to somebody when, who responded to you in a bar in Washington and said, what are DPIs? How would you respond with a vision that would make them interested to learn more? Well, I think I'd start by telling them that DPI is not something new and that it was invented in the US uh, because I believe that the US public investment in internet and GPS with proper interoperable protocols and so on laid the foundation for the innovation that we see today in the internet with all these big, great companies and so on. 
So all DPI is really how do we continue this journey and build different types, either directly by the government or enabled by the government, different types of population scale technology, which is accessible and useful to everyone. How do we layer that with simple ways to interact with protocols? And then how do we unleash market forces on that is the way I would describe DPIs. And the reason why I think it's important is because we have become a society with a very high level of digital intensity. The pandemic has shown that every part of our lives is digital is pervasive, it's ubiquitous, it's without that we, we won't manage. And if our societies are going to be so digitally entwined, it is important from a public policy perspective to see what should be the architecture and, and approach to this digital infrastructure so that it drives economic growth, it drives inclusion, it drives innovation, it creates competition, it creates a more equitable society. I think these are all public policy goals, but they are all informed and shaped by the digital infrastructure that you have. So the architecture of your digital infrastructure therefore becomes a vital issue of public policy and that requires a way of thinking about it. And DPI is nothing but a way of thinking about our digital, public infra uh, digital infrastructure in a way that society's goals are met. In some, I mean, you mentioned. I, mean, I, know, I know the bar will, the guy in the bar will be, he'll be on his third drink and he may not be, you know, not ready to listen I mean, to this long diatribe. You'd diet be surprised what a guy in a bar in Washington can discuss oh, that's on true. his third that's drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fifth drink where you oh, get real yeah. insights. I'll go early um, then. I'll go early to the bar for it. Um, you mentioned several public policy goals, uh, among them inclusion and innovation. Um, and I wonder how, whether you see those as. Uh, in a kind of vision statement for DPIs, is, is, uh, would you be able to make a case uh, for one or the other? In no, it's ways? both. It's in inclusion and innovation. And I'll give you an example of uh, the two examples in the Indian scenario. One is uh, mobile, mobile services, right? So India uh, has uh, among the most dynamic mobile markets uh, the lowest rates on data and more than 700 million unique users of smartphones and all that happened in the last five years. And the reason for that is that it essentially enabled a newcomer like Geo, which of course has a very deep pocket, uh, to come and build a world-class 4G infrastructure and take market share and, and just drive a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of change. But if you, if you dig deeper, you'll see that the reason why Jio was able to reach 100 million customers was they used the Aadhaar-based KYC, or Know Your Customer, which allowed them to enroll a million customers a day. So a DPI like the Aadhaar KYC enabled a private company to accelerate customer acquisition and change the structure of a mobile industry and led to massive inclusion with 700 million people. So there is a connection between uh, inclusion and growth, and that led to, you know, it's an innovation. Similarly, if you look at what's happening in our payment, payment business, UPI, which is a protocol uh, operated for payments, has 300 million uh, consumers on it, 50 million merchants where you can make payments. Uh, it does 7.8 billion transactions a month. And, but the innovation is led both by the banks as well as companies like uh, PhonePay, which belongs to Walmart, Google Pay, they have built innovation on top of this to reach a billion, uh, reach 300 million people. So you can have inclusion innovation because inclusion requires low-cost technology at your fingertips, and that's what all this does. Mm -hmm. From a technical standpoint. Um, it seems like to harness both the inclusion and the innovation uh, benefits maximally, you want to drive down cost, maximize scale, and yet a large integrated system could be perceived to have more vulnerabilities in the sense that it, if, if the system goes down, you've got a lot of your economy running on it. Um, how, do you, how do you square the concerns about the technical security of, of large systems like this? Again, I think uh, we should distinguish between the, the, the compute and technology running aspect and the data aspect. 
yes, this requires highly scalable, low-cost uh, architectures. But again, we have used open source technology liberally from here and used commodity hardware and build these massive uh, capability to do a billion transactions a day, but at a very low cost because of the power of today's open source and all that. But the important thing for your question is, where's the data? And it's important to realize that the Indian model is not about centralizing data anywhere. The data resides where it should reside. So the bank data is in the banking system, the healthcare records are in the healthcare system, the education records are in the university or whatever. What this infrastructure does is it allows you dynamically and in real time and in a secure manner assemble that data for a particular purpose. So the data is actually federated. It doesn't sit in one place. So it's exactly where it was before, except that we have built a coordination layer on top of it, which allows you to take from here and give it there. So it's really not about accumulating stuff in one location. So this is a really thought, thought, a thought through approach to data, which is a federated, stay where it is, bring it together when required. Um, I want to come back to some of the technical concerns that people have with security and, and, uh, and the risks, but I think even if you imagined a system that was unlike any system that we have anywhere in the world, but a system that was technically perfect and invulnerable, you would still have kind of at least two kinds of related political challenges. Um, the first, which you hear from a number of voices, particularly here in the United States, is the concern that to have a government-run DPI system poses real challenges to the flourishing of the private sector and of private sector actors because it vests the government with enormous power. Uh, whether it uses it at all times, it vests the government with enormous power over private sector development. And related to that, there's a kind of civil liber liberties challenge, which is you know, uh, particularly in this country, I think there would be a lot of resistance to the idea of d digital ID, even with proper understanding of it, because that also gives the government a, a power to know things. Um, a, a yeah. private, it raises privacy concerns. So let me ask the second question first. I think, I think we all accept that we need to have digital IDs, because in a digitally intermediated world, if every transaction, every activity we do requires the other side to confirm that you are actually the person you claim to be, you need a digital ID, right? Now, you can choose to get that from a private company, which is what you do. And then, of course, that provides that company the ability to collect a lot of data about you and use that to target you ads and all that stuff. So that's your choice. You want to do that, that's fine. Or it could be a government ID and there the risk is the government uses the ID to also collect data about you and then to do surveillance or whatever. So the way we have done the ID is actually, while it is provided by the government as a utility, it is not a data collecting ID. It's only a verification ID. So it does not collect any information. So it only, so you want to open a bank account, you, and you, the bank wants to confirm that you're in John, it verifies that you're John at this address. The bank account is actually open in the bank. The ID system does not know how the ID was used. This is what we call as the principle of optimal ignorance. Mm -hmm. And by definition, the ID system is only being used to verify or do a KYC, nothing else. So we get the benefits of a publicly available low-cost ID system without the risk of data collection either by the private actor or by the state. It's actually a design principle. Uh, that's the first second. And your first question was about what will private guys say and so on, right? In all markets, when there is technology innovation, there are winners and losers. So typically the guys will object up the potential losers, right? That's the way markets work. But there are also a bunch of potential winners that these things create. Now, I'll do a thought experiment. Let's say that we had sat here in 1968, and we are debating packet switching, which is the fundamental basis for the internet. We would have had one large company saying, no, we need circuit switching. This packet switching is all, doesn't work, the security risks with it. 
there have been the ITU saying, no, we need to use an international protocol called OSI. There have been another big tech company of that day saying, no, we'll use X25. Because in any time there's technological change, there will be a set of actors whose current offerings are potentially under risk. But it so happened that at the end of the day, packet switching won and the internet won because it was a superior technology. So exactly the same thing is happening today. So it's nothing new to me. It, it happened before. I mean, you didn't have that conversation on packet switching here in 1968, or you'd have exactly the same conversation then. So it just, that's the way the world works. So I think we, we, therefore, we cannot allow ourselves to be colored by that. We have to, when we see a system of who's for it, who's against it, we can very clearly figure out why they are for it or against it. And then we have to figure out, is it in the public interest to do it? Then we have to deal with the, with the political economy questions you raised. I want to I, I want to come back to the the privacy or civil liberties concern because I think respectfully I think I got half an answer which is that the current practice that your your assessment of the current practice of the Indian government in the in the context of India stack and obviously there are a number of DPIs around the world not all of which have the same guardrails in place but that that you you assess that people's identity is sufficiently protected and that it's only the optimal ignorance uh, principle uh, make, make sure that it's only used for the purpose intended. Correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, but that doesn't change the fact that if one wanted to misuse it, uh, one still could. You can put guardrails in place as a, as a policy, but with some technological adjustment, you could, you could access still. Well, uh, again, I, I can only speak about the specific instance of what we have in India. Yep. Uh, it is architecturally designed for optimal ignorance. It's technologically designed to prevent data collection. And it's legally designed not to be shared. So it has architectural safeguards, technology safeguards, legal safeguards. Now, you can argue that somebody could come along and change the law and all that. Sure, that's going to happen. But I think when we look at all these DPI things, when you look at what it can do for a country, whether it's economic growth, inclusion, or innovation, growth, whatever, we have to say, yes, there are potential risks, the risks of privacy, the risks of a panopticon state, the risks of cyber attacks from, and we have to build for those, we have to build things in a way that we deal with those risks, because the fact that those risks are there is not an argument for doing nothing. Of course there are risks. Well, crossing the road is a risk. So I think we have to think about how do we design for risk. Because the benefits to a country with this stuff, in our view, and maybe we are biased. Of course we are biased, because we, you know, we are evangelizing this stuff, so we are biased. The benefits are so overwhelming that we have to think through the risks and contain those risks. Okay. I don't you've, know, did I? you've opened up a conversation into what what the guardrails might be. And I guess that exists for me on two levels. One is, um, as you look around the world and see other countries developing their own DPI infrastructure and, and, and your experience with India's uh, experience in this, what do you think are the most important things to focus on in terms of thinking about the guardrails for this kind of technology uh, or this kind of this suite of technologies? Um, and then the second part of that question is, what aspects of those guardrails should be things that should be coordinated internationally? I think the three big guardrails. One is privacy by design. Designing these things in a way that you know, privacy is inherent in the design of, the, of all this stuff. Uh, second is uh, planning for uh, cyber security and making sure that as you put more and more of your living on this system, then you, sh you should make sure that it's not compromised in any way. And third is ensuring that the data is distributed and federated by design, by law, by whatever, so that the risk of it being collected in one place is minimized. I would say these three things. And the and do you see an opportunity? For, I mean, obviously, that can be incorporated into domestic policy making and, and legal regulation regi regimes. Yeah. Is there an opportunity for that internationally? All this is embedded in, in laws and regulations and technology, yeah. And is that That's why we call this as a techno-legal approach to uh, building technology. In other words, 
we build the technology, but also build the regulatory and rule system to embed this in it. So it's like embedding policy in code, as Rahul keeps telling. <laughs> and would you, would you see that, I mean, perhaps to put a finer point on it, um, uh, India's current chair of the G20, and DPIs are on the agenda for, the, for, for India's chairmanship, and what aspects of the kind of regulatory guardrails approach are most ripe for coordination internationally? And is there a specific focus for the G20 agenda that you think is important? I think so. I think you know it's uh, at a point in the journey where I think the notion of DPI as an idea is, is, is spreading. Uh, but I think you have hit upon an important point that even as we spread the gospel of DPI, we have to go along with the safeguards required, and that should be part of the thing. And may perhaps more could be done on that. But uh, I think it's, I mean, maybe it, for us it comes naturally, but maybe it has to be articulated. Uh, so I think uh, any DPR conversation should come along with a package of safeguards and how to implement them. I agree. On the, on the way that countries figure out how to finance uh, DPIs. One of the things about DPIs is that, as compared to DPIs, don't cost money. Yeah, hard infrastructure. These this infrastructure project uh, is easy to finance. It's a rounding error. And, and so, can you say more about what that means for kind of the prospect of of quick rollout? We have a saying: DPI needs deep conviction, not deep pockets. Because when you look at the challenges in the world today. The climate transition is going to cost us trillions of dollars. Debt relief is going to cost us hundreds and billions of dollars, if not a trillion dollars. The cost of implementing DPI is maybe a few billion dollars. It's literally nothing on the scale of the game. And in many cases, the DPI recovers the money from the efficiency gains it has. To give you one example, uh, India has saved, and these are official figures from the government, has saved $27 billion in streamlining the delivery of benefits, whereas the ID, other ID project maybe spent $1.5 billion. So it's not just that it costs money, it actually saves you money. So I think I don't see a financial constraint to DPI. We can, you know, wire the whole world with DPI and very little money. It's more about conviction, it's more about a mindset, it's more about having a bias for action, and it's more about understanding that DPI is a strategic and philosophical approach to digital transformation, which is not doing some backroom guy building IT in a silo in some ministry. That's not DPI. DPI is a way of thinking strategically on how do you advance a country's goals using a digital infrastructure. I'm gonna ask one more question then open it up to the room, so please get your questions ready. And for those of you online, please submit them. Um, during, the, uh, by coincidence perhaps, or maybe you'll tell me it isn't by coincidence, but, but it seems like by coincidence, the rapid development of India's DPI infrastructure coincided with um, the pandemic. And one of, the, one of the use cases that is often talked about, or one of the demonstration cases that is often talked about, is that the, um, the combination of the, ability, the, the rapid inclusion of people in the banking system that was facilitated by DPIs and the ability to, for the government to distribute benefits that way significantly helped uh, India's overall economic resilience to the shock of the pandemic because people, lar large, many millions, hundreds of millions of people who would have otherwise been completely uh, uh, had nothing, were able to get payments that allowed them to subsist through the, through the pandemic. What is, if you had to think looking forward, do you think there's another kind of stellar example of the way that DPIs can enhance societal, societal resilience that you see around the corner? I mean, what are the kind of... Yeah. What are the kind of aha moments that you think yeah. are waiting for us? Let me just clarify on the earlier one. Yes, during the pandemic, India transferred $4.5 billion to 120 million beneficiaries real time into the bank account. And that was part of the resilience. 
But to do that, it had already reached a billion Aadhaar IDs by 2016. In 2015, Prime Minister Modi launched the Jandhan Yojana program and went on a massive program to get everybody a bank account. So by the time the pandemic came along, everybody already had a bank account, everybody already had an ID system, and the mobile disruption or the mobile takeover that happened in 2016 with Geo. So in some sense, the foundation of that was already there. And that's the point about these DPIs, that you, if you think ahead and build them, then when the crisis actually occurs, you have something to work with. Because let's say that, you know, in many countries, in Europe, for example, in a couple of countries, they're talking about spending billions of dollars on energy subsidies because of the whole gas Russia thing. But energy subsidies should go to only to the deserving. But they don't have the plumbing to figure out who are the deserving. So everybody gets the energy subsidy. I have friends in this country who are well-paid IT engin software engineers who got a stimulus check. They didn't deserve to get a stimulus check. So I think having plumbing is very important. So I just want to clarify that while the mm -hmm. pandemic demonstrated the value of it, the, the stuff had been done earlier. I think now the big thing, the many things, but the big thing could possibly be the stimulation of the econ economy by the democratization of credit and the infrastructure that India is creating with the account aggregator framework which allows small companies to use their digital footprint to get access to credit will really enable, stimulate growth in a much more broad-based manner and allow millions of small businesses to get access to credit. Hopefully they will add people and jobs will be broad-based. So I think the growth possibility through a well thought through DPI is where we see a very uh, good opportunity in the coming years. Okay. Um, if you have questions in the room, please raise your hand. We have roving mics, it looks like, that will come around to you. Um, yes, I'm going to start in the room. Yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, introduce themselves. It's Amlan from, uh, I'm a non-resident scholar at Carnegie. I've really been enjoying listening to your conversations, uh, Amlan. Um, I have a question on the principle of autonomy or choice, which I think is also a very important uh, principle along with all of the others that you described, and um, whether it's a question of whether you want to opt into an ID system or how you want to verify your ID, whether through digital or physical means, or how you make a payment or how you receive uh, a direct benefit transfer. I think the question of choice, autonomy, empowerment, whatever you want to call it, is important. I'm just wondering how you would build this principle into a DPI. Is it through code, is it through law, or both? Well, I think uh, uh, the ID is actually by choice, but because of its ubiquitous nature, you know, people need to have it for something or the other. But I'll give you a couple of examples of choice. First is, before this plumbing, when governments gave cash benefits to people, like they gave uh, unemployment insurance or they gave a pension, the money would flow as cash to somebody who then, somebody in the system, a junior officer or bureaucrat or something, and he would then hand over that cash to the uh, beneficiary. And invariably, that transaction would have collateral damage. Right? In the model that we have now implemented, when those 120 million people got money into the bank accounts, it went in real time, straight through processing, directly into the bank account, so there was no intermediation. And there's a network of a few hundred thousand business correspondents who have devices where you can go do an Aadhaar authentication and withdraw money from your bank account. What that does is now you don't have to go to one person to get your benefit. You, you go to a network. And when you have a network, then you have choice to go to any actor on that network and if one of the actors on the network is not behaving well, you go to somebody else. So it's a market mechanism. And the bargaining power therefore shifts from the supplier to the consumer. So that's a good example of choice. Similarly, in the UPI example of choice, you can have your account in any bank. You can use any app you want. You can use Google, phone pay. And if you don't like your app, you can switch it in one second and continue to do all your transactions. So choice and empowerment is 
built in in many, many of these things. Now, in some cases, obviously, if it's a foundational thing like an ID, uh, you know, there is, of course, people may not take the ID, but then their life tends to get difficult, so they do take the ID. But in all other things, actually, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of choice in everything they do. Thanks. I'm going to turn to an online question, then come back to the room. Um, somebody online asks, "What is needed to bring together a common understanding of DPIs among government, private sector, and civil society? How would how would you suggest kind of facilitating that, arriving at a, a, a more harmonious common view?" Well, uh, in some sense, I think one of the reasons for the uh, Indian success is because of the events and initiatives the last 10, 15 years, there is that common understanding. There is a common shared vision of what is possible. So in India, we have political leadership, which is extremely committed. Prime Minister Modi, Finance Minister Sitaraman, Governor Das of the Central Bank, they all have a digital first approach to problem solving. The first question they ask is, can we do this digitally? I don't know how many political leaders in the world ask that question. So we have political commitment. We have a large number of people in the bureaucracy who have worked on these things and believe in it. We have a lot of technocrats who are willing to serve on these, making this happen. Uh, entrepreneurs have tasted success. Today, phone pay, which belongs to Walmart, has a valuation of $12 billion because they built their, build their whole business on UPI. So they know that there's real money here. And because of the Supreme Court privacy judgment, which was a very long judgment, we have a legal system that is fully understood the modern issues of sex, privacy and so on. So I think it's by happenstance, serendipity, whatever, we now have a shared vision of that. Now the question then comes is, how do we take this elsewhere? And I think uh, we have to work with countries and align all these key stakeholders uh, to get this outcome, because you will not get this outcome unless there's a shared sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, coming back to the room, Mike, and then over here. Mike Nelson here with the Carnegie Endowment doing technology policy issues. Um, I've been doing tech policy for a long time, and me. the four issues that Dan mentioned, vision, finance, security, and uh, or, uh, technology and, and governance are always important. But in my experience, there are two other ones that sound trivial but can be more important. One is the factoid challenge. For any good idea, you need three powerful factoids, preferably true. Preferably I count true. you had nine, so you've got that solved. But the harder one is the buzzword challenge. And in Washington, you only get four or five syllables for your buzzword. This is the, the phrase that is going to encompass your idea. And I'm sorry, but digital public infrastructure is a failure as a buzzword. It doesn't fit in a, in a tweet. It doesn't fit in a, in a headline. And you also are talking about the India stack, which meets Nelson's law of buzzwords. It's only four syllables. But it doesn't sound like something that Brazil or the Philippines or even the United States should care about. So I give you the opportunity to give us two better or two or three better buzzwords yeah. that uh, could could get the whole world excited about this because I'm excited about it. Sure. Yeah. I, I think that's. Uh, I don't think I can give you a, a spontaneous answer on both these things. So let let, let we'll think about it. But oh, I agree entirely. I think uh, you know. Uh, actually, you're raising, to me, a very uh, positive point. Because you're saying, look, I buy a story. You just have to improve your storytelling. That's what you're telling me, right? And that's far better than trying to convince you to buy my story. <laughs> so uh, we already crossed the first hurdle. You bought the story. So now we'll work on the messaging and all that. Over here, yeah. Thank you. Paula Hunter from the Mojalu Foundation. Um, we are working in the developing markets uh, to address financial inclusion. And when we talk to regulators about open source, they don't have the level of understanding and appreciation for, for it that you have in India and here in the United States. If you were to try to set their minds at ease, could you explain why 
India was willing to embrace not only open source code, but open source development methodologies into your, into your infrastructure? Well, I think India has benefited from uh, a long tradition of uh, technologists who have worked in and around the world uh, on all the leading sort of projects and all. So I think that inherent understanding was there. And uh, certainly when we began the Ada project and Pramod this year, we took a very conscious decision that we'll use a completely open source stack. Because we had seen, I think what we had seen was that, you know, again, in, in, in the, the US companies had built open source stacks for a billion people, right? So Google has billion consumers on Chrome or, Andro or Maps or Android, and all built on open source. And they were also, I think all the companies were uh, I think generous enough to put many, much of this code into the open source world. Uh, so I think we took advantage of that. Uh, so I think we, if we have to convince uh, you know, countries where maybe they don't have that level of technological sophistication, it has to be perhaps on the basis of their sovereignty. That if, we want, if technological infrastructure is so critical to our future, then we should own it and we should not be dependent on someone else for that technology. We should not get locked into the technology. And I think your open source argument is not about whether the code is open source. It's about a sovereignty argument saying that with an open source approach, you are in charge of your own technological destiny. That's how I would frame it. Thank you. Uh, over here, yes. Well, I think, uh, uh, I, think, I think there's an issue of what is the standard inside the country and what's the standard across countries. And I think, I think in today's world, I think I'm not sure we can create a global standard. I think, you know, to create a global standard, the globe has to get together, so it's slightly problematic. So, uh, so I think we have to probably perhaps continue with uh, you know, the fact that every country makes its choices. But I think we have to think of a set of interoperable protocols uh, which are there. I think, I mean, we have seen that, right? I mean, uh, EMV is a good example that you guys have done for cards. Uh, the GSMA has a good GSM standard. The IETF and the Internet, W3 Consortium has Internet standards. So the world has seen how to build those uh, standards. So I think uh, we have to do both uh, at the same time, you know, build these things at the same time, think about these interoperable protocols to go forward. You mentioned, I'm gonna come here in the room uh, in a minute, but I'm gonna go back to online. You mentioned that um, you thought maybe India was the only place in the world where the government's first reaction is, can we do this digitally? And I'm sure that I'll get a call from the Estonian ambassador <laughs> later today. But one of, the, oh, yeah. one of the big differences between Estonia and India is the size of India's bureaucracy. And I wonder- oh, the size of the country too, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> Which, which reflects the size of the country. Um, and one of the questions we have is how you, um, how, what was India's experience in overcoming uh, challenges in institutionalizing this, including competition between different parts of the government that might see the potential or the development going in different directions, and how, how was it institutionally set up to uh, encourage uh, innovation and improvisation on DPIs? Um, how much time do you have? <laughs> in that context. Well, well, I think you know we were fortunate because uh, when I joined the government, uh, uh, fortuitously, uh, one is that you know I was at the rank of a cabinet minister, so I had some leverage in the system, uh, and second, I was housed in the planning commission, which was uh, attached to the prime minister and was uh, cuts across all departments. What happens with DPIs is that if the DPI is initiated by a vertical ministry, then that ministry's uh, mandate overcomes the need to make it a horizontal capability, right? So if, if the mandate is from the finance guys, then tax collection becomes the dominant thing, not the ID. 
If it's from the passport guy, then it's issuing passports. So when the functional need dominates the design, you create ultimately something that becomes silo-ish in its approach. Whereas you really need to create something which cuts across. And both by the fortuitous thing that I was in a part of the government which cut across thing and the fact that I had access allowed us to create this ID system. And then we distinguished functional ID from foundational ID. The foundational ID is John is John or Jack is Jack. Functional ID is a passport, a driver's license, or a, or a, or a you know, voter ID card or whatever. So the moment we unbundle the foundational ID from the functional ID, uh, all the functional IDs heaved a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. because they, got, they, they said, who's this new kid on the block? We're already doing IDs. Why are they coming and giving IDs? And you know, all that stuff starts. You know, turf is a big thing. So the way we handled that, we finessed the turf issue by saying, look, guys, we're only going to say John is John. You decide whether he deserves the passport or not. Then they all heaved a sigh of relief and said, let's, let's do it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Coming back into the room over here. Hi. Uh, my name is Ankita. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins. Uh, my question is, you spoke of thinking ahead back in 2014, 15, which is partially why India was prepared for, uh, for COVID. So how are we thinking ahead in 2023 uh, from two aspects? One, from the technical side of things, are we looking at uh, incorporating AI uh, for, uh, for a better fraud detection? Or are we looking at a blockchain uh, technology to uh, ensure that our transactions are safe? Uh, uh, incorporating digital currencies that we see are a talk of town in Asia? And, and on, the tech, uh, on, on the political side, uh, sort of working with the ASEAN partners um, to, to export something that we have an expertise in, we have aced this low-cost model that we can work with them and have uh, better bilateral re uh, relationships and a soft power in, in, in the region. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, clearly uh, many of these things are being worked on. I think, uh, by the way, uh, AI is already being used extensively in the public space. Uh, today, uh, if you look at our tax systems, uh, our tax systems are fully digital. So whether it's income tax or GST, everything is online. You pay digitally and, you know, so it's already pretty sophisticated. And behind the scenes, they have a lot of AI for detection of fraud and non-compliance. And one of the reasons, uh, you know, if you look at India's tax to GDP ratio, it's growing. And the rate of tax growth is higher than the rate of GDP growth because it's a combination of technology, compliance, and formalization. And the compliance part of it is driven by AI. So that's one example of AI. The, another example of AI is the Indian Supreme Court is using language AI to translate all witness depositions and documents into Indian languages. Uh, Aadhaar authentication is all based on AI. So there's a lot of AI at population <coughs> scale. It's not some small stuff. Now, going forward, uh, you know, there's a lot of work happening today on how we can use the newer AI and generative AI and all that. But it's always through the lens of how do we benefit a billion people with this? And, and you know, how, for example, education. Can we improve the outcomes of learning, of reading and writing, if every child has a personalized tutor and stuff like that? So I think those are very solid conversations we're having. We had a workshop just three weeks back with more than 250 people only on AI for development. So I think... We are keeping on that. On the blockchain side, you know, obviously if there's a use case, we would do that. It's not clear we have found enough use cases for that. Uh, and on the cryptocurrency side, I assume you mean public crypto and not the private stuff. So yes, the Indian government, the central bank has come out with the digital rupee. It's a CBDC. They have launched it, and uh, you know, we'll. Uh, I think it's. It, we'll see how that goes. You know, we are. Ecumenical to the technology. We're not zealots about technology A or B. We look at it from how does it benefit a billion people and then work backwards. And if we don't have a compelling answer for why it will not benefit, then we won't spend our time on it. So that's been the philosophy of how we do it. On the second question, I think uh, it's uh, definitely uh, uh, the DPI is becoming more, of course, notwithstanding the naming and all that, uh, it's, it's becoming more common. Uh, many countries, there are at least 50 countries today in the world who are implementing some kind of uh, uh, DPI. And uh, it's one of the big topics of conversation in the G20. 
Uh, hopefully, it will be a topic of conversation in U.S.-India relations. So yes, absolutely, I think there is an effort to see how the DPI stuff can be made more global. I'm going to return, uh, if there are other questions in the room, please uh, flag my attention, but I'm going to return uh, to an online question, which is another version of something that we, we discussed in the context of c civil liberties, but this person wants to know how, how we can ensure a fairness of usage of tremendous amounts of information about citizens, demographics, their behaviors, which is now at the disposal of the government. And I understand that you've talked it is about... It's not at the disposal of the government. I understand that you've talked exception. about... That, that, that there is privacy to, by design built in, but to put a concrete example, I mean, there are obviously cases where government ministries do have some information about people, some information, not, I understand not all, but the relevant information about people. And I think there's a discomfort even with that. And, and I don't know if there's anything more deep to say than, yes, there's a trade-off between sure. knowing things and being able to serve people appropriately and, and privacy, and that's just, that is a public policy call that different yeah. societies and cultures have to make. I was Secretary of Higher Education for the state of Colorado uh, at one point, and one of the things that we wanted to work on was how to have effectively a digital ID that would follow students and that would allow us to be better about suggesting what educational pathways might be most promising for them and, and pay off most well. And there was huge resistance to it among parents and families that, that you would have kids, students being, being identified that way through an education system. Is there anything deeper than just say than than the argument that yes, you would have to know some things that the government doesn't know right now in order for the government to serve you better? It, one is whether the government knows it, and as I explained, the data is not in the government; the data is in the bank or the health uh, in the hospital. So it's it's no different than before. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that if we increase the digital intensity of our lives, we are going to create digital footprints. That's that's reality. Now, those footprints may be with private companies or the government, and both may misuse it, which is what is happening. So we have to put in safeguards to minimize the misuse of data, and there's a whole set of philosophy, technology choices, which is there. But we also know that human beings do trade-offs on privacy versus benefit, and we see that all the time. Like, I landed in Washington on Saturday, and uh, I've finally become a member of Global Entry. And I was quite shocked that so many people have this Global Entry. There are more people in Global Entry than the regular bloody line. <laughs> Maybe I should have gone there. Now, what, how does Global Entry work? You look at a camera, they take your picture, they do a face recognition. Now, if you tell everybody, oh my god, face recognition, it's, you know. But people are standing because they're saying, if I sign on to Global Entry, I clear my immigration and customs in two minutes, which would have taken 15, 20 minutes. So I'm making a trade-off saying, look, it's worth scanning my face, so I save 15 minutes. So all human beings trade off privacy versus convenience. And this is the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to your point about Americans and digital, uh, digital ID before, uh, many people um, probably don't think about what, uh, what internet protocols already create in terms of a digital footprint. Uh, in that respect, and how much we've already disclosed, yeah. IP addresses. Are there other questions in the room? Yeah. Hello, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Aljoy Tanos. I'm a student at uh, John Hopkins SAIS. Um, you uh, talked about G20 for a bit, and I couldn't help to um, think about Indonesia and who, who experience a strong digital economy development, especially throughout the pandemic and afterwards, um, especially through the e-commerce and fintech sector. So could you elaborate how um, DPI, DPI could um, help Indonesia potentially increase their digital economy as they try to you know, uh, play catch up with technology uh, innovation that's happening in the country? Well, I think uh, Indonesia actually has done a lot of amazing work on technology of great companies like Gojek and others. Uh, there, Tokopedia, you have, you know, you have several thousand islands and you have to provide connectivity, which you are doing. Uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Ms. Mulyani has launched this EKYC. So there's a lot of things happening uh, in Indonesia, which is very, very good. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, maybe some of the things we are doing, uh, there's a whole education initiative that's going on in Indonesia. So, so I think uh, there's lots happening. Perhaps more could happen if we have a dialogue with, with Indonesia. But I, I would actually rank Indonesia as 
among the leaders today in applying technology for, for public purpose? Are there, if there are other questions in the room, please, yes, over here. Oh, hi, yeah, um, Ken Figueredo speaking. Um, you talked about India benefiting from um, developments that had taken place many years prior. So in the case of mobile, uh, you had the mobile market developed internationally, you had standardization uh, that was developed through uh, the 3GPP uh, partnership project. Um, to, to, to what extent do you consider DPI as being more than technical? And uh, an example I would give you is uh, rights-based uh, systems such as uh, GDPR. Okay, would they, would, would those kinds of frameworks uh, be considered as DPI? And then kind of like leading on from that is a lot of these developments are happening um, either internationally or in bodies outside of India. How does India either become a fast follower or try and influence where those kinds of um, infrastructures are heading? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I mean, you know, the world has progressed to the rapid dissemination of standards, right? So internet itself became a global phenomenon because we had common standards. GPS became a phenomenon. The GSM voice networks of 2G in the 90s were because the GSMA, the Europeans came out with the standard. India adopted the GSM and that's how we had. So we see that uh, EMB cards is another example. So we see examples of that. Uh, I think the uh, we have to basically see how to uh, make take advantage of all this uh, to uh, create a, a perception of the value of DPI, perception, reality, whatever. And I think taking it globally is, is, is a big, big issue. And you know, it, it requires all this to happen. It requires uh, consensus building. It requires uh, ideation. It's required looking at the safeguards and, and so on. But the first question was specifically about what? The first question? Uh, GDPR. Ah, so I think, yeah. So clearly, you know, in the space of uh, 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 regulating a digital economy, I think digital rules is obviously part of that. GDPR, Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act. Our nuance is that regulation itself is not enough. Because regulation often has unintended consequences just as regulators. In some cases, it favors incumbents because you're increasing the load of uh, compliance, and therefore you have to be a big company to comply. And therefore, if you have a small startup, you'll probably not comply. And therefore, actually, it's not favoring in new newcomers. And therefore, our view is that you need to take a techno-legal approach. In other words, you have to build the technology and the law together, which is what we have done in many of these cases. And so, while regulation is important, regulation by itself, without thinking through the technological infrastructure, regulation is Necessary but not sufficient. With that, you are you are the co-chair of uh, the task force on DPIs for the Indian G20 chair, chairmanship, and I assume in that context that you are also thinking about the longevity of that agenda beyond the Indian chairmanship and and talking about and talking to the future chairs. Um, but in the context of thinking about kind of an international agenda on GPI uh, on DPI, DPIs, have you? thought about where, sorry, I got GDPR in my brain, um, uh, on DPI, have you thought about, have you considered where you might like to see the development of an international conversation about standard setting and whether there is an existing forum for that or whether it's actually something that needs to be created uh, and, and who would be logical yeah. as a convener of that? No, obviously I think uh, to take the DPI thing to its fullest uh, maturity requires many of these things, institutions and all that. I think we are at that stage of the journey where uh, the idea of DPI itself is getting, you know, people are absorbing this idea. Uh, I think uh, there's a recognition coming that this is perhaps one of the things we need. Uh, we see a lot of uh, ground uh, demand with 50 countries at some stage of putting in some DPI or the other. So I think uh, now we are to, I think all of us have to figure out what is the institutional arrangements to, to perpetuate this, whether it's G20 or something else. 
And I think there are many global examples of how it's been done in other sectors. So I think that's, but I would say it's early days yet to predict what's the exact contour of that. But it's, it's kind of inverted from, if you look at the, uh, the example of the internet, certainly, like the standard, set of bo setting bo the standard setting bodies, or at least the ones that ensured techno technological uniformity, et cetera, existed before the rapid uh, development of the internet, whereas here we see kind of a rapid rollout in many countries and no, no extant kind of formal global conversation about uh, technological standards, safeguards, et cetera. It's an unusual... Um, no, I, th I think, uh, again, uh, the bulk of the DPIs are for internal transformation of countries. You know, how do you make that country more efficient? How do you reduce transaction costs? How do you improve the ability to give a loan to a small business? So these are not necessarily about global interoperability. So I think you need to have the conversation simultaneously where countries build digital infrastructure for themselves and then also have, a, I think the same question the gentleman from MasterCard raised, and then parallelly have the conversation on how to make countries work together on things. I think the payoff is really how do, how do you use DPI to accelerate economic growth, democratize access to credit, include uh, you know, all the people into a formal economy, increase taxes, reduce, uh, you know, become more efficient in the distribution of benefits. These are all domestic things. You know, you've got to do them. Whether these then talk to some other country is a uh, next order thing. So I, I, I think it's, the DPI is slightly more at a level of usage than, than a technological thing alone. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question from the audience that follows up on the question I asked you earlier in terms of kind of what the next big thing is for, for India. Um, and you mentioned the democratization of credit, uh, particularly for small businesses, as, as one of the next big things That's for right. DPIs. You also briefly alluded to the, the intersection between DPIs and kind of green transition. Um, and could you say a bit more about what you think the potential is for, for that intersection? Well, I think... I, to be honest, I don't think we have a fully formed view of the intersection of DPI and climate. I think there are some obvious things. Uh, two examples are uh, the how do we transition from subsidizing hydrocarbons to encouraging renewables. And it is actually a $600 billion question in the world, so it's not a small question. So what happens in most parts of the world is that the energy subsidy is embedded in the price of the product, right. which is what they're doing, by the way, in, in, in Europe on this energy. They're actually absorbing the cost. But the way we do it in India is that the energy is sold at market price, and the subsidy is given as a cash transfer hmm. for 120 million people. So if a cylinder of gas costs 900 rupees, and you want to him to get it at an effective cost of 600, you don't sell it at 600. You sell it at 900 and put 300 rupees into his bank account. Why this is important is that then you, one is it enables competition in that because you can now buy from anybody because it's market price. And the 300 rupees goes into the bank account of the deserving, that's the initial benefit. But tomorrow, you can say I'm going to withdraw the 300 rupee uh, uh, subsidy or cash benefit for fuel uh, for gas. I'll give it only for solar, so I can actually use the direct benefit transfer to immediately switch the incentives to move to renewables. It's one example of what you can do with this. Or, or in many parts of the world, you have a need to uh, say in the Amazon, you want to uh, make sure that people don't cut it down to plant palm oil things or whatever then you can actually use this infrastructure to pay, uh, you know, give them money uh, to encourage them not to, you know, cut forests down. So there, there are many things, but I must admit we don't have a fully formed view on this. Maybe next time I come, I'll give it to you. Okay, great. Um, if there are any, this is the last call for questions in the room, and it, there is one over here, and I was going to say, if not, I have a last one myself. And Be resilient to regime change? Uh, you have to make them resilient to regime change. I mean, mm -hmm. do means you have to, yeah, you, you, you have to, obviously, because DPIs uh, benefit from uh, 
broad continuity, which means that it, they have to be resilient enough to deal with climate, uh, not climate change, regime change. By adoption. Yeah, adoption is a good way to do it. And the good news is that uh, a DPI infrastructure which is beneficial to a large number of people is uh, politically protected always. There, there's a threshold after which there's actually a huge vulnerability at some point where people are kind of 40% dependent on it, but when they become 70% dependent on whatever, it. Whatever, I don't know what that uh, whatever, yeah, tipping whatever, point yeah, is, yeah. but uh, yeah, at some point. You can't screw with yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You or, said it, or, I didn't or, say you, it. or you do it at your peril. Um, I know that you're I mean, all, you, you also face that problem with TikTok, but that's a different problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but that's not what's going to happen with TikTok. Um, uh, I know that in addition to doing uh, meetings here with foreign policy with the foreign policy community, that you're also in town this week, um, and that you're doing some meetings with the spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank. Yes. And I wonder what your message is to that audience, um, those institutions. Well, actually, you know, uh, we've been having very good meetings because, as I said, uh, two things. One is, from a World Bank perspective, uh, we are seeing more and more countries uh, coming for, forward to be part of the DPI journey, and the World Bank has the convening authority to bring countries together and provide them both financial and technical assistance to make it happen. So that, that, that's the piece the World Bank, I think, is doing a lot. And yesterday, we had a discussion with some 10 countries and so on. So that's on that side. On the IMF side, I think uh, IMF has just come out with a very good paper on, uh, on India's digital journey. And I think it talks about how uh, this is, will help in making economies more resilient, uh, improve the targeting of benefits so that there's less leakage and waste, uh, increase tax revenues, how it can help in formalization. So that's more the macroeconomic dimension of things. So both, uh, given their vantage points, are, are looking at it a lot. And uh, many of the events this week are on that. Excellent. I want to... Um uh, I, I know that you are and you, a self-described evangelist for DPIs. And a plumber I, who's an evangelist. <laughs> a plumber who's an evangelist. Um, and sometimes when you have conversations with people who are an, an evangelist, uh, you, you get conversations that lack candor. And I want to thank you for the candor that you've had in this conversation and the matter-of-factness with which you've addressed some of the hard questions. Those hard questions obviously will endure. And I know that uh, if I were... If, if I were putting on the hat of being an evangelist in this country, there would be an ongoing conversation, especially about those two political issues with respect to the private sector and civil liberties. And so this will be a longstanding conversation, and I hope that you will come back for future iterations of it and that we will be able to continue the conversation. Sure. Thank you for making the time for Thanks. a public event here today. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to all of you who participated both uh, here and also joining us online. We're very happy to have you on behalf of the Carnegie Endowment. Thank you. Thank you.